I tell you, it's a funny time of year to be making gardening videos. Half my audience is under feet of snow, while the lucky ones living in warmer regions are experiencing strange weather regardless. With the latest batch of quickies, we've turned to true indoor growing. Not quite ready to start this year's summer seedlings, the episodes have been concentrating on indoor herbs, fertilizing inside versus outside, and growing in our homes when the outdoors is just not feasible. I actually like this time of year because it means I get to spend more time in my greenhouse, more time planning and more time reflecting, reflecting on things that did work and things that didn't work. So in case you missed it, here's episodes 111 to 120. Enjoy. Raspberries are the ultimate low maintenance crop. Tough, hardy, and virtually foolproof. Most times, it takes a concentrated effort to completely fail at growing raspberries. But certainly, even experienced growers can make mistakes along the way. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're all about eliminating those mistakes. And today's episode is all about raspberry plants. More accurately, the mistakes to avoid so that you can get better harvests year after year. I got three to share with you today. Time short as always, so let's dive in. The first mistake that many people make when growing raspberries is to let the suckers go hog wild. Now, the suckers are the adventitious basal shoots that sprout out of the base of the plant. Left unchecked, they'll most definitely become an unruly mess, restricting airflow and generally clogging up the lower parts of the patch. And just like tomato suckers and strawberry runners, these shoots are a total drain on the raspberry plant. They aren't gonna flower or fruit for you, so just remove them as soon as you see them. The second mistake that raspberry growers often make is not knowing what variety they have. Raspberries are a perennial crop, but with biennial shoots. June bearing raspberry plants will only produce flowers and fruits on the second year canes, ones that have already gone through a winter dormancy. Cut or prune them too early and you won't get a single raspberry. There are everbearing types that grow fruit on the first year canes, but still, you gotta know your variety. And the third mistake that we're going to focus on today is improper pruning. Usually in the case of raspberries, this means doing it too early. New and old growers often think that pruning and winter raspberry preparation go hand in hand. In fact, the timing of pruning your raspberry patches happens much later in the winter or even into early spring. Valuable sugars and carbohydrates from the stems, even the dead and dying ones, are leached back down into the main plant. This is a necessary function for surviving winter dormancy and ideally pruning is gonna happen after the fact. We should be leaving those shoots on for as long as possible to give the mother plants the boost they need. And you know what's gonna give you the boost you need? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Winter. The garden has gone quiet. The hustle and bustle of summer is a long gone memory. But there's still stuff to do. The plants may be dormant or dead, but we're not. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll keep you busy no matter what the season. And today's episode is all about winter work. Specifically, I got five winter tasks that are gonna make your next year's garden bigger and better and save you a ton of work in the process. Hey, time short as it always is, 
So let's dive in. Some winter tasks are necessary, like a general cleanup, but some are an investment for the future, future crops and the harvest they bring. And one of my favorite winter investments is to collect and reclaim my old soil. All my spent pots, containers, seed mats, plug trays, anything that was growing something has some perfectly good soil left in it. Look, buying soil at the store every year is expensive, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with some used dirt. Weeded, sifted, and mixed with some fresh compost, your recycled soil could be a difference maker next year, and with very little effort. The second thing I make sure to do every winter is weeding. Now, you obviously have to do this before the first major snowfalls hit, but weeding is one task where that old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, totally applies. With their roots barely established and super easy to pull out, a little bit of weeding now can save you hours of time in the spring when, quite frankly, you don't have it to spare. Back to the good stuff. As growers, we all know the importance of healthy protected soils. It's why our number one task was to reclaim this stuff. But what about the rest of our garden? Not all of us growers have planted everything in pots and containers. And not everything we grow are strawberries, garlic, and other treats that are sitting patiently waiting for winter to be done. So our attention then turns to protection. Soil covers, mulch, chop and drop, and even cover crops, provided it's still warm enough to plant them. Cover that soil at all costs and protect it from the harshness of winter. Another crucial winter task is pruning. Raspberries, grapes, and certain fruit trees are all best pruned in the winter. The cold dormant season is when this task is done, although you can wait until spring. I rarely do though, because I know just how busy I'm gonna be. And finally, our last winter task is to organize our seeds. If you've been growing a garden for more than one or two seasons, quite likely you've amassed quite an array of seed packets. It can be a good problem to have, no question, but you should always take stock of your seed inventory. As you guys may have noticed, seeds have become increasingly expensive, and that's if they're even available. Although it seems early, seed starting is amazingly just around the corner. So, with rising costs and seed shortages becoming the norm, it makes sense to take stock of what you already have. That way, you're not going to miss out next spring. Just like you're not going to miss out on the next episode of The Garden Quickie. For my money, easier is always better. And sometimes we get lucky, and better is also easier. In the land of herbs, particularly those grown from seed, there's many ways to plant and be successful with them. But the method I show you today works 100% of the time. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we show you all the best tricks. And today is all about planting your indoor herbs. Specifically, growing them from seed in the easiest, most foolproof way possible. Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Herbs, particularly the lush leafy ones grown from seed, are some of the best plants to grow indoors, especially for new growers. With winter upon us, and it being entirely too cold to grow outside, right now is the perfect time to start your indoor herb garden. Lucky for us, it's super easy to get going, and all we need are four things. A potter container that freely drains water, some premium potting soil, one to two squares of paper towel, and the seeds themselves. That's it. 
To get yourself started, fill up your container of choice with moist premium potting mix all the way to the top. Using your hands or another container, compress the soil down slightly, about an inch or so, to make the perfect seed landing pad. Go ahead and spread your seeds nice and evenly on the surface, thick and heavy for something like cilantro, more sparse for something like basil. Almost all herb seeds are planted quite shallow. So just skim coat them with about a quarter to a half an inch of that same soil. Now comes the key part. Taking your paper towel, fold it up and mold it so that it covers the entire surface of the soil. Wet it with a splash of water to hold it in place more effectively. As well, this is actually how we're gonna water the seeds all the way until germination. Doing it this way is brilliant for two reasons. One, it not only spreads the water nice and evenly, reaching every single seed equally, but two, it also prevents evaporation, creating a moist little tropical paradise for the herb seeds to work their magic. Sprout the seeds at a temperature range of 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit for the best results, and within a week or earlier, you're going to start to see signs of life. Water your herb seeds every two days from planting, and at the right temperatures, the new herblings are going to be poking through the paper towel around your fifth or sixth watering. Remove that paper towel before the seedlings get too leggy, right around the time they get their first true leaves. You want to give these guys as much direct light as possible. And with that, your herb garden is on its way. Hey, it may be a bit cold outside, but picking fresh herbs daily keeps your garden game strong no matter what the season. Know what else is going to keep your garden game strong? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Soil pH is one of the most important parameters for plant success. Fall too far outside of that acceptable range and your plants are going to suffer and underperform at best. And at worst, they'll just simply perish. That's why being able to quickly test your soil on the fly is very, very useful. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, being useful is our specialty. And today's episode is all about that soil pH. Specifically though, how to test your soil quickly and cheaply with just two household ingredients. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. To start, collect two equal samples, about a cup's worth each, from the soil you want to test. If it's a really large bed or plot of land, and you believe you got some hot spots, you can collect soil from different areas. Or, you can combine the soil for an overall measurement. With our soil samples collected, let's test for alkalinity or high pH first. Both the acidity and alkalinity tests work because of the principal reaction that acids and bases have when they meet. Remember back from grade school science that when an acid comes in contact with an alkaline or basic substance, bubbles form. These bubbles are in fact carbon dioxide being released from the relatively violent reaction. Therefore, all we need to do is add a sufficient amount of acid, in our case some vinegar, to that soil and watch for bubbles. If you see bubbles forming and it happens almost immediately, then you have a soil with a pH that is alkaline or greater than seven. Now, if there's no bubbles, like I'm seeing here, then we know that the soil is either neutral or already acidic. So that's great, on to the next test. For acidity, this is where our baking soda comes in, but first, we need to liquefy the soil by adding a sufficient amount of neutral water. Usually around 50% of the volume of the soil that you're testing works great. In this case, we got a cup of soil, so half a cup of water should suffice. A nice good soupy mixture is what we're after. Now, add a single heaping tablespoon of baking soda and watch for action. If the solution bubbles, then we know that we have a soil with a pH below that neutral line of seven. 
If nothing happens and we didn't already do that first test, then we have to assume that this soil is either neutral at 7 pH or already alkaline. So it's only by combining the two tests together that we know whether or not we have an acidic or an alkaline soil. Both tests need to be done simultaneously to be able to rule the other one out. Now, these tests won't give you the exact part of the 14 point pH scale unless in fact your soil is neutral. Then you know it's seven. But it'll give you an idea of where your soil is at on the spectrum, which is massively beneficial to any grower. Know what else is massively beneficial to any grower? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Hey, I've never been one to discourage people from trying to grow their own vegetables. In fact, my entire life for the last decade has revolved around growing my own food while teaching and helping others to do the same. But sometimes certain crops can definitely put up a fight. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always looking out for you. And today's episode is all about Brussels sprouts. Or more accurately, why not to grow them? I've got three reasons you might want to avoid these bad boys. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. As a member of the Brassica family, for whatever reason, pests just love these guys, especially aphids. Your Brussels sprouts under any level of stress, no matter how minor, could trigger an outbreak, much more so than any other crop. Another difficulty with these guys is timing because you always want to be harvesting Brussels sprouts when the weather is cool. Which means if you're hoping for a spring crop, you're fighting the frosts at the beginning of the year on tender young plants. And on the flip side, if you're aiming for a fall harvest, well, those same young tender seedlings are being planted in the heat of summer. In general with gardening, timing is everything but especially with Brussels sprouts. Lastly, Brussels sprouts are a long crop, even in the world of brassicas. And this is bad for two reasons. One, the longer a crop goes, the more time there is for something to go wrong. And two, the length of growing time exacerbates the first two points of this video. More chances for pests and more difficulty in getting the timing right. It's not that you shouldn't grow Brussels sprouts necessarily. It's just that you need to be diligent to set them up for the best success. Just like you should be diligent in watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. I know I say it all the time, but plants are amazing. Sprouting, growing, producing, some of the crops we grow know no bounds. As is the case with basil. Hi. I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we also know no bounds. And today's episode is all about basil. More specifically, how you can harvest it in such a way that it actually multiplies and produces more and more and more. Hey, we're never short on basil, but we are short on time. So let's get into it. With many of our herbs, we have to blanket sow them to obtain full pots and lush harvests. And while this can be done with basil, it's not ideal and certainly not the way the plant is supposed to grow. Okay, so how do we get that unlimited supply? Well, the answer actually lies in how we harvest it. New basil growers often collect the largest leaves selectively, leaving the rest of the plant to grow. That's fine with some herbs, but with basil, all that does is leave you with a bare plant that often perishes. Instead, we need to be completely ruthless when we're harvesting our basil and cut entire tops off. It seems harsh, but as long as you keep one to two nodes on the plant remaining, each one is going to sprout exactly two new shoots in its place. This is how basil is designed to grow. And by law of simple mathematics, you can see how one to two shoots could eventually become a huge forest of basil. With a large enough pot, good soil, and diligent top pruning, 
you can harvest a staggering amount of basil continuously from just one plant. No one has ever complained about having too much basil. Just like no one has ever complained about having too many garden quickies. See you in the next one. Normally, basil is a lush, impressively uniform plant with the most immaculate foliage. Velvety smooth goodness bursting with pesto potential. Basil is the best until it isn't. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're also velvety smooth. And today's episode is all about this basil, or more accurately, the browning and blackening of the leaves. I got three reasons why this occurs, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Basil is a subtropical herb with soft broad leaves that while highly prolific and productive, are also highly susceptible to environmental stress. And when the stresses get too great in too short a time period, they manifest themselves as browning or blackening of the leaves. And the first reason this occurs, and it's by far the most common stressor, is temperature. Basil loves and does best with moderate even temperatures. 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal with no big daily swings. Too cold for too long and the leaves will most certainly turn a shade of purple, brown, or even black. It's why basil does so well as an indoor plant. So, if your basil is starting to brown out or fail, first look to the temperatures, both the averages and the extremes. The second most common reason basil gets brown or deformed leaves is improper watering. Sometimes you'll see too little water causing it, but more often than not, it's from too much watering, coupled with poor drainage. Waterlogged soil displaces air, turning itself anaerobic. When this happens, the basil leaves fail and turn brown from both lack of oxygen as well as depleted nutrients. Try to water once a week or less and ensure adequate drainage. Finally, the third most common reason for basil leaves turning brown are pests and disease. While basil is pretty hardy on the pest front, they can sometimes get aphids, thrips, or even spider mites. On top of that, they can get dampening off as well as fusarium wilt, which is a fungal disease. Proper airflow and not overwatering your basil are the best preventions. As for cerium wilt, once the plant gets it, there's no coming back. What is coming back though, is another episode of the Garden Quickie. Hope to see you there. Herb seeds unlock the potential of some of our most favorite plants and start them off on this journey of their amazing life cycle. And for some crops, like the cilantro and dill here, it's the only way to grow them. But for some herbs, they have the ability to skip this step entirely, unlocking unlimited potential in the process. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we unlock your unlimited potential. And today's video is all about herb cuttings. More specifically, my top five herbs that allow you to skip the seeding process altogether by rooting the cuttings instead. Time short as it always is, so let's get into it. Skipping ahead and growing a plant from cuttings as opposed to seeds has distinct advantages. Lots in fact, but for the sake of this video, here's my top four. Like we said, it's faster, much faster, as you're skipping the majority of the life cycle. Two, it's cheaper, as the only requirements are usually a glass of water and the plant you already have. Three, it's often more reliable and foolproof. And finally, because the cut shoots are a direct clone of the main plant, you can choose the best genetics, the best stock, and keep them going. Not all herbs can do this, like we said, but those that do, do it well. And the number one plant that's the best at doing this by far is mint. 
Rooting mint is literally the easiest plant to do this with. And if you're just starting out and you want a plant to practice with, mint is your first choice. Another herb that many people don't know that easily roots itself from cuttings is thyme. And it makes sense because thyme is actually a member of the mint family. Being a somewhat woody perennial, it's not quite as foolproof as mint. Best done in the spring when the shoots are actively growing, try to select the new lush green shoots for the most success. If you've ever had trouble getting those tiny seeds started, thyme cuttings could be the answer for you. For most of our herb cuttings, we're using the tops of the shoots, including several nodes along the stem. But for chives, it's all about those bottoms. Just like with its larger cousin, the green onion, leaving the white root section intact after harvesting is going to allow you to root one of the easiest plants to propagate. Within a week of sitting in just water, these guys explode with brand new white roots. You can keep the cycle going and literally never have to buy a single chive ever again. At number four, we got a bit of a tough one, but it's so worth it. And that's rosemary. The woody stems can be challenging to initially get roots from, but even this is preferable than growing them from seed. Patience, the right time of year, and choosing new lush green shoots seems to be the answer. And finally, our fifth herb on the list to grow from cuttings rather than growing from seed is basil. Also a member of the mint family, basil readily roots from its cut tops, which is great because we're always cutting the tops off of our basil when we properly harvest it. It works so well that by staggering the cuttings every two weeks or so, you'll have an unlimited supply of this pesto powerhouse completely for free. Know what else is completely free? Checking out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. The beauty of indoor herbs is that they're often the gift that keeps on giving. Harvest after harvest, they keep coming back to life to provide the bounty. But it all comes at a cost. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always for free. And today's episode is all about fertilizing and replenishing your indoor herbs. Hey, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Growing herbs indoors, such as this little batch of oregano here, comes with a whole host of benefits. Things like moderate temperatures, no harsh weather extremes, and of course, they're virtually pest free. But grown inside, in tiny little containers, the plants don't have access to an infinite supply of nutrients to keep giving us those harvests. On top of that, the smelly organic fertilizers that we normally use outside aren't really ideal for indoor life. Even the ones that we love, that we make ourselves. So what can we do? Well, there's two ways to handle this. One being before we plant and one being after. First up, we can fortify our soils before planting with slow release organic solutions, things like alfalfa pellets, rock phosphate, and rock dust. Build up that soil to be so nutritious that it lasts for the life of the herbs, which can be upwards of six months or more. The other option comes after planting and that's a liquid organic feed. Only this time, we're going to skip the fish fertilizers entirely and go straight to kelp or seaweed extracts. Right off the bat, there's going to be far less smell and the array of micronutrients and trace minerals in these types of fertilizers is going to fortify the herbs to taste better and be more nutritious than ever. For NPK, you want to shoot for a balanced mix, if not slightly higher in nitrogen. When we grow herbs, it's all about the foliage and N, or nitrogen, is its biggest contributor. The best time to fertilize is right after each major harvest. That's when the plants are going to need replenishing the most. Just dilute to the manufacturer's specs and watch your favorite indoor herbs bounce back faster and better than they ever have before. Know what else is better than before? Checking out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. The time of year is almost here when all of us gardeners officially become residents 
of Crazy Town. Display after display hoping to entice us with unlimited future harvest potential? It's nearly impossible to resist. Okay, but what about last year's stuff? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always visiting Crazy Town. And today's episode is all about seeds. More specifically, can we use last year's leftover seeds? If so, how long do they actually last for? Are all seeds the same? And how do we know if our seeds are still good? All valid questions, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Right off the bat, I totally encourage you to use last year's seeds. Now, not all of our crops have the same longevity, but for the most part, most seeds can reasonably be expected to live two, if not three years. But which ones last the longest? Well, you'll find that all members of the brassica family, such as kale, collards, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts, all routinely keep for up to five years. After that, your melons and squashes should be good for about four years. Same with your nightshades. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, all lasting four years if stored properly. And what is stored properly, you ask? Well, the key is low humidity and low temperatures. If heat and moisture are the catalyst for our seeds to sprout, then cool temperatures and dry conditions preserve them for longer in their dormant state. 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and a low relative humidity is what you're after. Light itself doesn't seem to play a part in the storage, but I keep mine in the dark just in case. Okay, great. But aren't there some seeds that just don't last very long? Yep, definitely. There's a few crops whose seeds shouldn't be trusted beyond the next season's plantings. Crops such as onions, lettuce, corn, leeks, and sometimes even carrots and peas. Look, if you're ever in doubt, you should always do a seed viability test to make sure. It's easy peasy, and if you've never done one before, check out the video in the top right corner. Hey, know what else is easy peasy? Checking out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.